So we're going to look at some of the ways that people now actually study movement, coordinated movement in animals. We saw in a previous video the groundbreaking studies of Edward Muybridge, where he documented using very elaborate photographic setups that a horse, when galloping, has four legs off the ground. Now, horses have a wide variety of gaits. Oh, that's not actually a real horse there, one of those, one of those is fake. Um, horses walk, trot, canter, um, pace, gallop. Um, different horses have different gates at their disposal. Um, gates are organized coordinations among four limbs. One gait that the horse doesn't have is this one, which is the pronk. Let's have a look. There's the pronk. <laughs> And that gate has all four legs in phase. All four legs are going through their cycle at the same time. All other gates will have different phase relationships among the legs. You may have seen that peculiar gate called a pronk before. Where are you, my studs, dear cat of love? All over I am looking someplace for you. Pepe Le Pew is the other famous pronker. So you can look at a wide range of quadrupeds and their various gates. And while there's variation, every time you find a stable gait, you, you, given what we've done so far, we can actually describe it. Um, so here are six examples, and what's shown there is, uh, beneath each example, you can see the length of time that the foot is on the ground, and by looking at how they're distributed over the cycle, you can see the phase relationships between the legs. Bottom right hand is the prunk, all four legs are in complete synchrony, they're at the same place in their cycle at the same time. Whereas up at the top left, we have almost a perfect antiphase relationship in that gallop, and we see different phase relationships for the other gates. Now this notion of phase is turning out to be quite useful, because it allows us to group a whole set of disparate observations and systematize them so that we can see them as different variations of the same underlying principle. Here's a, an extreme example of that, taken to great lengths. Many hundreds of species were looked at here, all quadrupeds, so they all have four legs. And for each gait of each species, two data points were noted. The percentage of the cycle that each foot is on the ground. So light little animals like that impala, their foot hits the ground and then they're in the air. Their feet are hardly on the ground at all. Whereas a hippo has his feet on the ground the whole time. You don't get hippos dancing, jumping around. On the y-axis, we're going to have the percentage of the cycle that the fore footfall follows the hind footfall on the same side. So we're just the phase relationship between two legs on the same side of the body. And with that, you can see that there's an area of possible gates. Each of these observations falls within that shaded area there. The same animal will occupy multiple points if they have multiple gates, like the horse here. But you can see that now we're in a position to make sensible, well-informed comparisons between different animal gates, so that it doesn't just like look like random variation, but we beginning to get a strong feeling that this notion of coordination, expressed as phase among oscillating parts, is going to be a powerful way to describe animal movement. Now, if an animal like a horse has multiple gates at its disposal, you can run and you can walk, horse has a few more, uh, one question we might ask is, is it just free to choose what to do at any given moment? Or, and as scientists, we're always looking for this, we're looking for lawfulness. Is there some kind of, something more um, informative going on? Can we say something more than the horse decided to rot, trot him that one day and the horse decided to canter the other day? Well, here's an example of a... Uh, an excellent scientific visualization from a paper in 1981 in Nature by Hoyt and Taylor, which reports back on an experiment done by th with three ponies. 
Uh, you won't understand this on your own. I'll walk you through the graph, but there's a lot of information in there. But you need to understand that what we have are three ponies, and they're very good ponies. These ponies were willing to walk on a treadmill at varying speeds, all the while they had a bag over their nose measuring their oxygen consumption. Now, not every horse is going to be willing to do this, so these were very, very well-trained ponies indeed. There's a second part of the experiment, which I'll come to in a bit, but let's first look at those data points there up at the top left. They are obtained while the ponies are walking on the treadmill at a variety of speeds. The speed is the x-axis, so there's slow speeds are on the left, fast speeds are on the right. And the y-axis shows you the amount of oxygen consumed per meter traveled. Now there's a radical difference here. If you walk very slowly or very quickly, you end up using far more oxygen per meter traveled than at the sweet spot. There's a sweet spot for walking where oxygen consumption is minimized. Good. There we've got the data from the trot. Now these ponies trotted at a much wider range of rates from very slow, overlapping considerably with walking speeds, up to very fast. And again, we see this U shape such that there's a sweet spot in the middle where oxygen consumption is minimized. And if you trot slower or faster than that, then you end up using more oxygen than is strictly speaking necessary. The data for the gallop are there on the right hand side. And I'm afraid there are limits to, to what you can actually do with these ponies. So we get the sense that this is also going to would be a U shape if we could get more data points on the right hand side. We can see that slow gallops are energy inefficient. You consume more oxygen per meter traveled. And there seems to be a sweet spot there. OK, then after subjecting the ponies to all this, they then let them out into the paddock and they observed them over a couple of days and they took note when the horses themselves decided to walk, trot or gallop. And that's the bottom part here where the black bars are simple histogram counts. They're counts of, oh, I saw the horse walking and it was walking at this speed. And what you can see is that when the horses are in charge of things, when they're deciding themselves, as it were, to walk, trot or gallop, they do so at the speeds which are optimal. They do so at the speeds at which energy consumption is the least, and they don't voluntarily or spontaneously walk or trot or gallop at speeds which are energy inefficient. There's an awful lot of information in that plot, isn't there? They're very, very good ponies. But it shows you that there is regularity here as well. The choice of gait is conditioned by, among other things, its efficiency in energy consumption. Incidentally, a follow-up study was done by a different group of researchers using more or less the same methods, but looking at a different variable. Instead of looking at oxygen consumption, they looked at hoof strain. So when the foot hits the ground, there's a certain stress placed on the hoof. And that stress is going to be depend is going to depend on the speed you're going at and the gait that you occupy. And what they found was more or less the same thing. There's a sweet spot where the strain is minimized for walking, trotting, and galloping, and it lies at the same point as the minimum for oxygen consumption. Showing you that evolution is a tinkerer, not a control engineer. Evolution plays with all kinds of variables at once, and we only get to see the finished product. So the fact that the first set of researchers choose to look at oxygen consumption, whereas later researchers look at something different, hoof strain, that just shows the limits of our power of observation. What it does show us is that these animals have evolved to move in an extremely efficient fashion across the board. So we've pushed away from the idea that the brain is doing an awful lot here. In fact, we haven't given the brain really a role at all. Um, and what we've seen now is the brain in the body, together with the constraints under which the movement happens, needs to be considered. So while I'm sure you're very, very confident that you are capable of walking, well, I should be careful, maybe you're not. Uh, if you are capable of walking, you're probably capable of, you, you assert that that's your ability. You can walk, it belongs to you because you're master of your legs. If I throw you in the end of a deep of a swimming pool and say, show me you're walking, you're very good at walking, you go, I can't walk. You can still move your legs in cycles like this, but 
it's not walking. Walking requires the floor. It requires a firm ground of support. Walking only happens when that's given. So once more, we can shift our viewpoint a little bit and realize that the body in the world um, has to be at, of a certain kind for correct gait to occur. In the 60s, there were some rather ghastly experiments done by uh, Soviet scientists in which they severed the connection between the cerebral cortex, the outer part of the brain, and the spinal cord on a cat. This cat now can do no voluntary movement. So we associate voluntary movement with the cerebral cortex. We'll come to that in a later video. Um, by severing the connections between the cerebral cortex, this cat couldn't, it was paralyzed. It was just limp. It couldn't voluntarily move at all. But when put on a treadmill, supported by a, um, a sling, because it couldn't stand, if the treadmill was moved, what was found was that the, leg, the legs organized themselves, self-organized, into normal, well, more or less normal gates with fixed phase relationships between the two, between, between the four legs. So that's kind of interesting because the, the higher brain is now not part of the story at all, and yet we're seeing under the right physical conditions, given this body, given this floor, this support, then the body self-organizes into a gait. And furthermore, as the speed was turned up, there was a switch from one pattern of organization to another. They stimulated a single site in the middle brain here um, in order to just give the cat some tonic energy, as it were. But there was no sense in which the brain was responsible or involved in setting the phase relationships among the legs. So the coordinated gait that emerges is clearly an, what we literally call an emergent phenomenon. It involves all the constraints. You need this kind of body, you need that kind of floor. I found video of this this morning. Trigger warning, here's a cat uh, walking. And you can see that the gait looks fairly natural. The cat is being supported. It's a grainy video, it's hard to see. Um, as the treadmill speeds up, you can see at no point do the legs become uncoordinated. Rather, it seems to switch there to a run. So this is all very passive in some way. The brain that is the brain's involvement in voluntary movement has been completely replaced here. And by studying this, we realize that an awful lot of movement is solved through physics. And this has led to developments in robotics. We'll get to robotics in a later video. But here's an example of a passive walker built using techniques developed from observ observations like that cat. This has no controller whatsoever, no brain, nothing is organizing the parts. It's built so that the legs, when placed on a treadmill, will self-organize into this regular walking pattern. Here's a little device made by Scott Kelso to torture his postgrads and uh, PhD students. You strap someone into this chair and you just turn them into a quadruped. Humans don't get, get around very well on all fours because our legs are so much bigger than our arms. But if you put someone into a chair like this, you can make them a quadruped. And furthermore, you can vary the weights on the four limbs to give, make them a quadruped with different kinds of legs. And what you find is they don't need any learning period. They immediately know how to move in a chair like this, and they produce four distinct gates shown there, the jump, the pace, the bound, and the trot. And you find that there's a rate-dependent transition from the bound to the jump, from the trot to the pace, as you speed the frequency up. So there's really not a lot of brain stuff going on here. What we're looking at is the emergence of patterns of coordination, given bodies of a particular kind, in environments and constraints of a particular kind. We recall that this guy has basically no brain, and yet coordinated movement occurs over all those legs. Now, if you were, don't do this, but if you were to remove those pairs of legs in pairs, remove a pair, remove another pair, what you would find is that the millipede or caterpillar works with either, um, never stops to think. They don't need practice, even though they're now walking with an entirely new number of legs. Their movement stays smooth and coordinated the whole time. So I think we've made the point that coordination is a much more fruitful avenue to explore than 
simple, simplistic notions of control. Ultimately, we're talking about the same thing. But if we push everything onto the brain, we miss the whole story, really. Furthermore, we have a lot more secure, we're mo a lot more secure in our modeling and our observations when we adopt the physical vocabulary. And we bring to bear centuries of mathematics and studying the manner in which oscillatory systems interact and couple and entrain. Okay, that's enough for coordination for now.